Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where right this very moment, Tom Hardy might be saying, just when I thought I was out, the audience pulls me back in. And maybe Sony with a hefty check. So yes, yes, it's truly never the last dance in Hollywood, especially in the age of nostalgia. Just ask Mr. Hugh Jackman till he's 90. And with a second weekend hold like this and a Rotten Tomatoes audience score like this in week two, it's held up. It would seem Venom has some gas left in the tank after all. Get get it? Because the, the latest one is a road trip movie. All right, so now one could argue that Venom 3 is succeeding because it is a goodbye movie. Let's let the guy go. But is it? Is it a goodbye movie? It has the loosest of plots. I mean, Logan was very much a goodbye movie, you know? Um, and then I even totally, I mean, you ha it's like very hard to see, but as many of you pointed out at the end of the end, like the last credit sequence, they're like, oh, Venom's still in play. So it's not even really a goodbye. I mean, really, it was potentially a goodbye for Tom Hardy. Uh, but I don't know. I think Tom Hardy could be persuaded to return. What do you think? What would you say to Tom Hardy? I would say, what else are you going to do, Tom? <laughs> the answer would probably be not much. All right, so... There are also, it seems, two reasons, two uh, very good reasons for why it's had such a strong second weekend hold, uh, hold. Best of the franchise, by the way. Isn't that amazing? So one, obviously, is that no other major movie entered the marketplace this weekend. So there was literally no competition. It was a total gimme from Hollywood. And again, I think that's because of the strikes. They're still low on... Well, it's interesting. They're not only low on content because the strikes held everything up, but I think... And I've seen some people discussing this. There's almost a deer in the headlights quality in Hollywood these days where they don't know what to do. And executives are being are afraid of being fired, uh, you know, and potentially replaced by AI. They are also in danger from AI. So, you know, nobody wants to be responsible uh, for a flop. So I guess their answer is not to make anything. Aren't there like, uh, don't you have to like hit, hit certain levels of of content production, you would think, but I guess not. You know, I'm surprised maybe at the end of the year, they're like, wait a minute, did we not make anything? <laughs> All right, so anyway, so yes, there was no uh, competition this weekend, no new competition. And then also it seems the World Series was a factor because it was short and sweet this year. Uh, even as a New Yorker, by the way, I appreciated this tweet about the Yankees. Uh, but it did not go into another weekend. It was over already. So yes, people went to see Venom 3. Uh, but also though, I think something else that's interesting because this is just so shocking. You know, so many comic book movies lately have nosedived right into, the, right into an empty swimming pool with the water being audience interest. It was empty. It was totally empty. So it's very shocking and it really kind of makes you just question life. It's, you know, you're like, what are we doing here? Um, it's shocking that Venom, that's coming off such a horrible sequel, and it's a spider man movie from Sony, with no help from Kevin Feige, it was able to not only stay afloat in its second weekend, but seems to be doing the backstroke in everybody's soup. Like, it's just, Amy, somewhere Amy Pascal, she was talking about, talking about what people are doing right now, Amy Pascal has yet another, uh, no, six, I mean, really, she has risen like the phoenix so many times, that should be her nickname. All right, so Sony has got to be over the moon and feeling a little bit better about Craven's chances later this year. They're like, ho ho, maybe it will do well during the holidays. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe it will. I mean, hey, once you've seen Wicked Gladiator in Moana, maybe you will check out Craven. You know, I mean, December doesn't have, like it has Mufasa and Sonic, but it, there's no Star Wars or Avatar or anything like that. You know, Craven is hoping to maybe... I mean, it seems ridiculous until you're like, hey, wait a minute, didn't Aquaman do really well with that kind of release date? And the Jumanji movies, by the way, the Jumanji movies, not only have they just announced a third one, but those are from Sony. So the fact they would say, hey, why don't we follow the Jumanji playbook for Craven, hot guy in, the, in, a, in a jungle, or like a jungle type setting, you're like, you might actually have something there, particularly after you see, although, you know, Tom Hardy is proven to be very likable in this role. Whereas, you know, Aaron Taylor Johnson has never been able to deliver box office, although he's never been this ripped. <laughs> All right, so I have a number of friends who are like, you know, I think I might see that. And they are not into comic books, but they are into hot guys. 
All right, now, surely Tom Hardy would like to make other movies during his career, what's left of it. Uh, Because, you know, at one point, he was considered a serious actor, although a lot of that, a lot of the loss of that uh, reputation is his own fault. As I said uh, before, he, he's kind of known for making choices that interest him, but do not really benefit the project or even really interest audiences. But he's amused. So we'll see. And I think, I think when I said that, one of you were like, what about his artistic credibility, Grace? Maybe he's an artiste. I'm like, did you not just see that he's in Venom 3? Uh, and also, you know, if, I mean, like, it's not like critics and some people were saying some of his artistic choices were good. <clears throat> he's not Daniel frickin' Day-Lewis over there. He's just doing dumb stuff in the corner. All right. <laughs> I think that's actually a pretty good way to describe it. I think that he could be lured back. I mean, if the fans like what you're doing, that's obviously something that's, you know, very touching. You might want to, you know, it's like, hey, where you're loved, you might as well stay there. But I, again, I think it's going to boil down to just how big a check Sony is willing to write him. And I think they'll probably write him a pretty good check. But they have to save some money for a spider person. No more Venom movies without a spider person. I don't care which one it is. I mean, I care a little bit. But we have lots of choices. Uh, I mean, if I were Tom Hardy, I would not agree to make another Venom movie if there wasn't a spider person in it. Uh, we missed our chance for Tom versus Tom, even though he was literally sitting right there in Mexico in No Way Home. It was ridiculous. They were one short of a Sinister Six, but I, I do believe the reasoning was that they didn't want to blow the, the big screen debut of the Sinister Six on a movie that didn't need it. Although a lot of us were like, is it the Sinister Six basically? So, I mean, I don't know, but I guess they didn't want anyone being like, here's the Sinister Six, when they could use that for another film. I mean, I guess I'll allow it, but I mean, he was right there. He was right there. Uh, there are rumors swirling that Andrew Garfield might show up in Spider-Man 4. I haven't heard these from any of my sources, but I've seen the rumors. But I say, no, thank you. Let Tom Holland finally get his adultish Peter Parker on and focus on a pure basic Spider-Man story with no other shenanigans. We've done that. And the ending of Sp Spider-Man No Way Home was just as good as the rest of the movie, if not better, because it seemed to promise that. So that's what we would like. Thank you. Uh, although I guess it all boils down to what Tom Holland wants, as he's made pretty clear. I hope he's on the same page as the rest of us. I hope he's on the internets reading what everybody wants. It's like, how did James Gunn miss that everybody wanted Brainiac? All right, so Andrew Garfield and Tom Hardy would be a great combo. Garfield's career is still struggling. I mean, we, we live in times not doing that great. So he'll do it, and both are very good at comedy. Are the Avengers a band? Are you in a band? That was a great line. Delivered very well. But bottom line, with no matter what happens, with Venom 3 at over 300 million worldwide in just its second weekend and close to the century mark domestic, this is like a really big freaking deal. This is incredible. It's probably going to outgross Alien Romulus and maybe even Twisters and Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Alien and Apes are getting sequels. Plus, that's just in theaters. I think Venom 3 will do very well on digital and streaming, where Sony, by the way, will put it on Netflix. And as I said last week, that's like the perfect streaming f service for Venom 3. I thought Venom 3 was pleasant enough, but as a comic book fan and from a franchise perspective, I was frustrated that it went nowhere and meant nothing. However, we talked about the days when movies didn't have to do anything like that. They just existed and they were propelled by charismatic leads in a fun time. And we wondered if that was something a movie could still get away with, and apparently it can. Isn't that interesting? It just, you know, Venom 3 might embody that. You know, I have some friends who went to see Venom 3, and they're not, again, not into comic books at all. It's the same ones who like hot guys. And they saw it, by the way, at a Regal 4DX theater. It was their first time doing that. I still haven't gotten to check one out myself. And they had just a fantastic time with this movie. They were like, we loved it. And I was like, wow, that's great. This is all very interesting from an analytical perspective and a business perspective. We're going to have to do some soul searching. Maybe nostalgia isn't just about bringing back IP, but also types of experiences. And maybe, maybe audiences just really like Tom Hardy as Venom, an example of excellent casting that can survive all manner of creative, business, and pandemic onslaught. People just like him in the role. Also, Sony is not gonna stop making these Spider-Man-less movies, it seems, not anytime soon at least. So I hope all of you that went to see it are happy. You better not, I mean, again, I thought Morbius was, I thought it had its moments, although Madam Web was just truly awful. I mean, these are really hit or miss. <laughs> but people keep giving them a whirl. Okay, so as I said, there were no new big movies in theaters this weekend, and we only have two 
from now until Thanksgiving. Uh, Heretic comes out this coming weekend and then Red 1, Red 1 after that. And because it's so slow, they're both able to get premium screens, by the way. Uh, Heretic will be on Dolby this weekend, and then I think Red 1 takes over both Dolby and IMAX the weekend after. Uh, so they have their window. Uh, but basically, there are no big, big movies until the weekend before Thanksgiving when Gladiator and um, Wicked hit. And they're, you know, they, they better make as, as much money as, as they can as quickly as they can because Moana is tracking so big that it's being called already Moana Apocalypse. What? That sounds negative. Well, I think it's negative for all the other movies because this is expected to now kick up such a huge storm of cash that it will come down hard on the competition. That's amazing. When it comes to advanced ticket sales, word is that it's so far outselling Inside Out 2 and behind only Deadpool and Wolverine, Wicked, and Dune Part 2. But wait a minute, Dune Part 2 only opened around about 80. So that to me means that last minute walk up business is a big factor in really blowing up these weekends at the last minute. But I think the Moana 2 is gonna have huge walk up business. I mean, how many of you are like, well, I'll just get tickets you know, at the last minute, especially for a movie like that. You're all, you're using up, for those of you who have like subscription services, you're holding on to Wicked and Gladiator tickets, maybe for multiple showings. So you're, you're, you're also gonna go see Moana 2, but you're not even on the radar yet because you haven't purchased a ticket. This could be huge. This could also, I think, in fact, it shows uh, a, such a big factor with, um, you know, the, again, those last minute walk-up ticket sales, particularly, I think, for family films. So I think 100 million, which is the number they've been, you know, talking about for Moana, that's the floor of what it could potentially do for Thanksgiving weekend for the three day. I mean, this is going to be big. All those years on Disney Plus seem to be paying off. The synergy machine is working. Remember they, remember Bob Iger was like, Disney Plus, at the very least, you know, it blows stuff up. And we were able to kind of like have uh, people watch other stuff. Like, again, when we saw Alien, when I saw Alien Romulus, I then watched all the, a bunch of uh, Alien movies on Hulu. And, you know, that's exactly what Disney wants you to do. All right, so back to, the, to this weekend. No big new movie meant... Excellent holds across the board for a number of films. Hollywood has long served leftovers the weekend after Thanksgiving, but it seemed the same approach has worked post Halloween, Halloween as well. I guess the metaphor here is you're still working on your, your, uh, your, your collection of candy. Uh, in fact, Hollywood did little to program Halloween this year, which is weird. Again, maybe because of last year's strikes. You know, usually there's, I mean, I guess for those of you who wanted to get your scare on, there was Smile 2 and Terrifier 3. But still, it doesn't really feel the same as past uh, Halloweens where like maybe a little, like, you know, Five Nights at Freddy's or another Scream or, you know, or something, you know, Exorcist, but that last one was awful. But you know, you know what I'm saying. So Hollywood's horror movie, Smile 2, has pulled a bit ahead of the independent one, Terrifier 3. But I do think that independent horror has really got a, gotten themselves a genuine foothold here. Uh, everyone laughed at the knockoff Winnie the Pooh horror movie, but I'll be damned if this new upcoming Pinocchio one doesn't look kind of good. You're like, oh, that looks fantastic. I'm super creeped out. And after Terrifier 3 did so well, I'm like, I bet people will go see this because it looks so good. Uh, somewhere, I think Guillermo del Toro might want to consult with his lawyers. All right, so <clears throat> social media pushes the edge of the envelope every day. And I think it's created an audience that appreciates that. And... Independent, independent horror is willing to go further than Hollywood horror and can go further than the establishment is able to do, largely because the establishment has so many checks and balances within. Independent film is leaner and meaner, and today there are more methods of distribution and reaching out to an audience. Uh, and audiences are more open to, you know, uh, to stuff that's outside of the establishment. In fact, they often sometimes prefer it. So, I mean, by the way, don't forget, as we discussed before, that Terrifier 3 is from the company that owns Bloody Disgusting, the name in horror news, and now they also have their own streaming service. As Hollywood becomes more and more enamored by technology, from algorithms to AI, they're already, so they're, they're already getting leaner, which is, I think, unfortunate, you know, it's replacing jobs. But can they also, can they get some good out of it? Can they get faster? Are they going to be able to pivot more? Uh, it's an interesting question that I don't even think Hollywood is asking itself. Probably because they're too afraid of the answer or what it would entail. That's interesting. A lot of the people who would answer, who would ask that question, the answer would probably not bode well for them particularly. So maybe that's why they don't want to bring it up. Hmm. All right. But why not the higher ups? You know, the top, the top of the food chain, you know? All right. And look at the wild robot back at number two and up 11%. My goodness. Again, I did not care for the film personally, but as I've told you before, 
I love a winner. And this is certainly shape, shaping up to be quite the winner. Uh, it's the momentum behind this film is getting stronger and stronger. And Pixar has got to be feeling the anxiety when it comes to who will win best animated feature. I mean, it's, this thing is becoming unstoppable almost. And ooh, speaking of awards, Conclave, I love to see it. I loved this movie. Had an amazing hold itself. Just a 20% drop in its second weekend, which means word of mouth must be at least solid. And I think people are certainly talking about it because it has such a controversial, uh, n a number of things about the film are very controversial. But it does have a surprise ending. So try to see it earlier rather than later so that you don't have that ending ruined for you. I was singing its praises in my mini review. I know I got some of you to go see it and you liked it too. So that makes me very happy. And this is just a nice slow burn. And this thriller set in the Vatican is an Oscar front runner. And so I think that it will be able to play potentially all the way through the end of the year in theaters. If I were focused, I would keep, you know, Universal's quick to put stuff on digital, but I would keep, con it's a great movie to see in theaters. It's such a great theater experience. Uh, I, Cause it's like they, it's, oh, speaking of nostalgia, it's like an old school kind of thriller. It's really good. So I think this can play in theaters all the way through till New Year's, especially as it starts to rack up nominations. Some of them being announced pretty early. Golden Globe nominations hit December 9th and the Critics' Choice uh, nominations, which I'm a part of, uh, right after on December 12th. And Conclave, I'm sure, will be have a ton of nominations. The Gotham Award noms already came out and Honora led the pack there. And while the movie fell out of the top 10 this week, uh, this weekend, it's still, it's still slowly growing as it slowly expands. They're doing a very slow rollout on that movie. Me thinks perhaps that it'll be too slow, but we'll see. We'll see how it works out for them. Meanwhile, Robert Zemeckis can old man complain all he wants about Jessica Rabbit, but he's clearly lost his touch. Back in the day, he ran with the big dogs as a director who knew what audiences and awards voters wanted, but now he just yells at clouds. I mean, anyone on the face of the earth could have told him that this movie was a bad idea, a stupid and super depressing stunt. I'd be like, nobody wants to watch that, Robert. Zemeckis is like the anti-James Cameron. Both are cutting edge, but Zemeckis always puts the technology first rather than the story, and it gets him every time recently. It's been 24 years since Zemeckis had a hit film, and it, it's not like he's retired. He's just bad. And this time, not one but two films from India were able to debut in the top 10. One, a horror comedy. They programmed, you know, uh, India had something for, uh, for Halloween, which I think is great. Uh, films from India are now able to break into the top 10 with some regularity. So hopefully, sometime soon, some business-minded person somewhere in Hollywood or in India will try to figure out what the next potential step could be. Where do we go from here? How do we blow this up and make this bigger, right? I mean, this is great, but we've been doing, for, doing it for a while now. So what do we do to, to take the next step forward? What would you recommend? I'd like to see more actors crossing over. One of the actors I believe was featured, an actor from India was featured in The Perfect Couple on Netflix but I'd like to see even more talent crossing over. I think that would, that would be a good potential next step maybe. All right, over on streaming, starting with Nielsen for late September, early October, not only is Penguin still nowhere to be seen on any of these charts, but Agatha all along has also fallen totally off. Totally missing. Wow, Disney's been putting out some pretty nice headlines for the last few episodes, but then why isn't Agatha on these charts? Some argue the shorter episodes and a single season put it at a disadvantage on charts that measure success in total minutes viewed and all previous seasons counting as one. But come on, these charts aren't very competitive, particularly towards the bottom. So, and other Disney Plus shows, which have had the same disadvantages, uh, I mean, there was, Loki was on season two, but how about Ahsoka? Short episodes, first season, still managed to chart. So, I don't buy it. Again, we'll see if both Penguin and Agatha are able to chart by the end of their runs, uh, especially as the binge audience kicks in. I know a lot of you waited to binge Agatha, and I know a number of you are waiting to binge the Penguin. Just two episodes left tonight and next week. Uh, so that could help them both. On the overall chart, Netflix is totally dominating, thanks to Ryan Murphy reviving the rom-com and trashy reality TV, the holy trinity of streaming. Uh, and Inside Out 2 is still doing very well on Disney+, Plus. the only movie on the overall chart, and so high up. By the way, the rest of this chart, six spots out of ten are all acquired content, which have tons of episodes, by the way, which does make them hard to compete with. 
It might seem unfair to include them on these charts, but it's important to understand what people are choosing and not choosing to watch. These shows, old and new, are all on the stream ser- st- uh, the same streaming services and all are, 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 are an option for audiences to click on. So I think we need to know. I think we need to know that many are choosing the older shows over the newer ones. I mean, you might not like it, but it's what's happening. Don't bury your head in the sand, man. All right, so Rings of Power can't make the overall chart either and has even lost some of its steam, dropping from the 700 range to the 500 range of minutes. Haven't heard too, too, much, too, much, too many teases lately from Amazon about making that third season. They're like, ah, you guys don't want it. And Only Murders continues to deliver pretty middling ratings, although they always get me with the hook for the next season. I'm like, to you, Leone looks fantastic. All right, I'll watch it. And I still love the, the trio. I really love the main trio. Uh, although I do think that this season ended up not being as good. But the show must be extremely cheap to make compared to other streaming shows, because I'm sure the main three are getting a, a lot of money, as, and they deserve it. Uh, but it's also an awards darling. It always gets nominations. And it looks good in the Hulu crown. And Hulu is still a little low on sparkly gems. I mean, it is Hulu's only show on the chart. So, so like, we're keeping it. And on the movies chart, look at Inside Out 2, how it's just dominating this chart and how low all the other movies are in comparison. I mean, I'm happy to see Salem's Lot so high up. I thought that, that again, was a really fun movie. But that number's so low. People just don't seem to watch a lot of movies on streaming, interestingly enough. I mean, how, it's hard to compete with seven and eight hour movies. And we, we, by the way, we can trash talk Netflix all we like about canceling shows and not advertising them but, and, and being a slave to their algorithms. But clearly no one can engage and hold on to their subscribers like Netflix can. I mean, these charts are just a clear example. And you know, you might be like, oh, they're looking at minutes. That's how advertisers look at content, you know, um, minutes, because that's how you t- decide when, when ads play. So that's how the game has changed, interestingly enough. Uh, subscribers, subscriber numbers, and then also when can you play an ad after how many minutes. All right, so over on Netflix's charts, that's Sam Raimi. He knows horror. Uh, and I mean, uh, Robert Zemeckis has lost his touch, but it seems Sam Raimi has not. Uh, his, his Don't Move, which he produced, is a very strong number one for last week. Women of the, Woman of the Hour grew a bit in its first full week on Netflix, but just could not compete with this film, which was only on the service for a few days for this chart. This is an excellent example, by the way, of the importance of packaging and putting together a film from a business perspective. Consider these two films before you. What do you think makes Don't Move more inviting for a click than Woman of the Hour. I'd be very curious because, uh, again, Netflix certainly didn't advertise either one of them. So, uh, and, and Anna Kendrick did a lot to push her film, but yet this other movie did far better. So I'm very curious to hear your theories down below. All right, then with shows, The Lincoln Lawyer jumped to number one in its first full week on Netflix, but that's a soft number. I don't know if we'll get a season four. These numbers are soft across the board as Netflix has a little bit of a lull in the show department this past week, uh, with both Nobody Wants This and Monsters having finally started to peter out in their fifth and sixth weeks, uh, respectively. They had great runs, but they can't last forever. Then on digital with Apple, it's the usual suspects. And interestingly, new releases Joker 2 and The Substance can't quite compete with what have been favorite movies now uh, on digital for weeks. Uh, And The Apprentice, on the eve of the election, couldn't break into the top 10, unable to find an audience on digital, just like it couldn't in theaters. By the way, while we all laughed at the Stephen King collection that was being offered for 10 bucks last week, remember remember I said they should pay us to watch it, to watch the movies that were included there, this Clint Eastwood 12 film collection? Oh, that's amazing. I clicked on it expecting the same garbage, and then I was like, oh my gosh. That's an amazing collection of movies. Wow, and again, for just $13. That's amazing, that's so good. Not only does it have his incredible, it's like, it's got the good stuff that he made. I mean, usually when they have a collection there, you're like, I don't even know Clint Eastwood made that movie. These are the big ones, they've got all of them in there, like Unforgiven's in there. Uh, And also a docu-series about Clint himself is included. Again, for just $13, you should pick that up. Now that reminded me when I was looking through and doing this, um, this episode, I was like, oh yeah, what about juror number two, which hit some theaters this weekend? Well, Warner Brothers, true to, true, just as they promised, true to form, 
they decided not to report juror number two's box office. But the industry is whispering that it did a little, little under 300,000 from just 35 theaters. So I, I did the math. Uh, and it's uh, that's a formidable per theater average of a little under 8K. That's very good. And it has a very good Rotten Tomato score. Did Warner Brothers bury this movie just like Disney did with Young Woman in the Sea? Nobody ever discovered Young Woman in the Sea, which went straight to Disney Plus and never even got a shot on digital. Will audiences ever get the chance to discover juror number two? Will it go to digital or straight to max? Clint, at 94, either doesn't have the ability or the interest to champion the film, like Kevin Costner at least tried to do with Horizon. Warner Brothers didn't do a great job releasing that film either. Uh, it seems that while streaming killed most mid-range movies, Hollywood no longer knows what to do with the ones that do manage to get made, which is sort of sad. Although it might also be the Nicholas Holt curse. Oh, I like Nicholas Holt too, but there's no denying that more often than not, he is a box office curse. What? I mean, I don't know. I'm nervous about him as Lex Luthor. All right, I mean, I'm sure I might enjoy the performance, but I mean, I don't know, let's see. I, don't, I think he's miscast in that role, but I hope that he turns out to not be miscast. Ever since Heath Ledger, everyone's like, you don't know. That's right. Well, I mean, well, I mean, you have an inkling, but we'll see. As for this coming week, uh, as I said, Heretic comes out after Halloween. Uh, and the Rotten Tomato score, speaking of Rotten Tomato scores, this one is impressive as well. And there, it's got no competition. It's the only new movie entering the marketplace. It's taken the Dolby screens. So Hugh Grant might have, might have himself a winner here. Uh, and this could be A24's The Black Phone. Uh, you know, very similar vibe. That was a great movie. I love The Black Phone. Uh, Lionsgate releases the best Christmas pageant ever. What are you doing over there, Lionsgate? I mean, I'm, is the computer responsible for that? I don't think the computer, the computer is like, I don't know her. Uh, and what are you, what are you doing, Anthony Mackie? My goodness, you're the new Captain America. Yet here you are starring in a new actioner from Vertical Entertainment that looks like it should be straight to digital. And while it is playing in theaters, for most of them, it's just one showing per day. What the what? There's also a new anime film, Overlord, which is taking over some of the IMAX screens this coming weekend from Venom. On digital, there's Sebastian Stan's A Different Man. Part of me is wondering what Sebastian Stan is doing as well. Uh, maybe Kevin Feige should have like a group that helps it's the actors outside of the outside of Marvel movies so that they don't embarrass the franchise too much. Uh, I'd be like, can't we get them a Disney project that's like somewhat acceptable? Uh, while on streaming, also on Tuesday, Netflix has a Christmas movie already, while Shudder has Black Cab, which I normally wouldn't no uh, note, uh, but I mean, horror is such a, a growing space these days, so I'm, I'm like, yeah, well, let's, let's take a look at what's going on over there, a little closer look, but also Nick Frost stars. That's right, that's Nick Frost, so that's a pretty big get. Then with shows, today, Max started their new take on like, on like Water for Chocolate as a series. While on Thursday, Netflix has part two of the latest season of Outer Banks and a special look at their upcoming Jake Paul, Mike Tyson fight, uh, which I believe is November 15th. Uh, and then Prime Video has a new version of Citadel. Whoa, Arcane is back. Netflix, they do not advertise this stuff. So Saturday, uh, you know, basically a week from today almost, they will start the first of three drops. So for three Saturdays in a row, they'll drop like a couple of Arcane episodes. It's like their version of Weekly. So that, that's how they, they're gonna do it. So uh, let's see. I, I mean, maybe one of the reasons Netflix isn't too behind the show is because it's it's the end. They already said they're not gonna do another, but they could always do a spinoff maybe. I don't know why it's the end. People love the show. It did very well, um, but you know, we'll see. And that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And would you make another Venom? Share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.